Next, first up this morning, we have a, a wonderful engagement. You're going to hear some introductory music by our friend Bill Vitek, who is not with us today, but I'm sure is watching um, on the live stream. So hi, Bill. Um, and Stan Cox, um, a fellow here at the Land Institute who's been with us since 2000, has had many roles as a plant breeder, um, is one of the smartest people I know. Um, he's in this fellow position, uh, which is a, is a position where, where he gets to sort of explore the outer reaches of the ecosphere to help us engage out beyond agriculture with, with the, the crisis and the debacle that we're, we're dealing with today so that we can have a broader understanding and bring that into our work. Um, Stan definitely has the courage to be uncomfortable and continues to stretch uh, himself and us all in interesting and ways. And he has the courage to tell the truth in a way that can be mightily discomforting. I'm sure some of you have read his books. Um, he's done, been doing that for a long time. And he has the courage to invite um, folks like Alexia Leclerc, almost, um, who is also working in the discomfort on the daily um, with their work that uh, will be described by, by, by the two of them in, in conversation. I want to make the connection between what you're going to hear here and this project in real time that also includes art by Preeti Cox. Um, you can see it over in the tent over yonder, so if you find yourself wondering um, on your way out, please stop. It's still there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, I invite you to muster the courage for this morning and to join these two in the truth and the discomfort of it. Stan, Alexia. Do we have the music? Mic's on? Okay. Good to see everyone this morning. Um, thanks for uh, hanging on. I think you're, you're going to be glad uh, that you did. Um, as Tim um, said yesterday in his uh, excellent talk, that the, the work we're doing here is going to be essential whichever way things go. Um, if if uh, the um, climatic and uh, political situations both are, um, uh, if we manage to turn those around, then we'll, our, our work will be needed. Um, and if it goes the other way, uh, as he said, it'll be um, even more needed. Um, and but, um, what we're uh, doing here today is um, also um, you know, discussing um, in the broader uh, movements for um, you know, uh, climate justice and, and environmental justice, um, how are they going to navigate the um, potentially perilous uh, years and months and years that we've got uh, lying ahead of us. In this um, series, um, in real time, I've been talking to um, people in the uh, on the ground climate and environmental justice movements <coughs> about this, what you know, uh, what they're doing now, and how they're you know, planning to deal with with uh, what's coming on, and and. Uh, it, all of that has been at a distance up to now over the past six months when I've been um, uh, doing this. Um, so this is the uh, first face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity that I've had to um, uh, speak with uh, somebody. And I, I, this is one that I, I thought I'd uh, want all, all of you to share in because I think you're, you're going to... Um, um, really like what we're uh, doing here. Um, 
Alexia Leclerc, um, good to have you here. <laughs> um, before we get into um, uh, what you're doing now and um, start empowerment and COP27, um, I'd like to go back to the work you've been doing. I, sh I should say, um, uh, uh, Alexia's from uh, Austin, Texas, and um, I'd like to go back to the work you uh, have done with uh, Poder in Austin, um, especially um, um, dealing with uh, marginalized communities living along the uh, e uh, east bank of the river there and um, some of the um, campaigns in, in, and, uh, of course, including uh, Tesla. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an absolute honor to be in this beautiful place with all these incredible people um, and so much knowledge about perennial agriculture. Um, so my name is Alexia and I come from Austin and I got started in organizing um, in middle school with PODER. Um, it stands for People Organize in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. And it was an organization founded in 1991 um, by some of the community members. Um, so just to give you a little historical background in Austin, Austin, like many cities in the United States, is pretty segregated um, due to the redlining. And so East Austin was where the black and brown community lived. And it was also zoned industrial. Um, so we had these toxic tank farms. We had the Holly Power Plant and all of that was causing extremely high rates of cancer and respiratory disease in the community. And a bunch of community members came together um, and started organizing to fight um, these, you know, in these industries. Um, and so they came together, they started petitioning, they started talking to the media, they went door to door, they went to city council members, um, they started hosting toxic tours for these politicians coming in to see the conditions that community members are living in. Um, and they were actually incredibly successful. Um, they kicked out six major oil corporation out of East Austin. <laughs> Um, so it's been an absolute honor to, you know, learn from my elders, my boss, Susana Almanza. Um, and so I think after some of these major wins, um, sadly, the issue continues. Um, and so I came in and started doing work um, in 2019 with them. Um, and we've been dealing with some of the pollution from the aggregate mining operations that are um, in the eastern side of Travis County, which is where Austin is um, located in. And then recently, you know, we've been dealing with issues with water rights, um, lack of access to clean and affordable water. There's a private water company that's been charging families um, around 400 to 500 dollars a month, um, which is ridiculous. And then we most recently have been doing some work uh, with Tesla coming in, and that's been a really interesting journey because, as you all know, um, Tesla produces electric vehicles, um, but there's actually a very high local cost to the Gigafactory, um, and a lot of the community members have been feeling it, things from like dust and truck traffic, um, and then Tesla's Gigafactory is also in a flood zone, um, which is going to be potentially causing future issues um, that we have yet to see, but um, given that they just recently started operating, um, it's going to be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. And so we continue, you know, building different campaigns around different environmental issues and also work a lot on local legislation. Recently we passed um, policy that helped protect some of the creeks on the east side, which do not have the same protection as creeks on the west side. Um, and so that's where a lot of my bulk of my work um, is about. And you um, mentioned that um, y'all had also been working in uh, just public transportation uh, issues. Uh, what, what's the situation there in Austin with uh, uh, transporta public transportation? Yeah, so one thing that we really advocate and push for is obviously a just transition, you know, away from the fossil fuel industry. And as part of that solution, um, Austin is actually building a new metro system. So Austin's public transport is not very well built out. And that's one of the things that they wanted to improve. However, um, their new metro costs $7 a ride. Um, which is very expensive, um, and their bus right now is at 275, so that's a huge, um, a huge jump. 
And so one thing that we really center is that just part of a transition, right? You can't just transition and leave low-income communities behind. Um, and so that's one thing that we've been doing a lot of petition around. We've been talking to Cap Metro um, and got them to reconsider some of their prices, but there's still a couple lines um, that they're still not sure what their price is going to be. Um, so that's something that we really push for. And a lot of our kind of uh, campaigns are really driven by what the community needs at the moment. We don't have a beautifully laid out 10 year plan. It's really kind of what comes up and what the neighbors are telling us and the neighborhood groups. Um, and so that, that is definitely part of the issue. And we also really see the interconnection of you know, environmental justice and different social justice issues. It seems to me that one um, thing that the uh, environmental justice uh, movement accomplishes is to um, demonstrate how too often the mainstream uh, climate movement um, uh, focuses on um, technological uh, fixes to try to kind of spruce up the current socioeconomic system uh, in, uh, to uh, supposedly de decarbonize it and, um, and you know, make it, um, it, keep it going in kind of the same mechanisms that got us into trouble uh, in the first place. But it, is that part of um, why you're focused uh, on uh, environmental justice as well as climate? Yeah, I think the environmental justice movement was actually really born out of, you know, communities of color and low-income communities being completely neglected from the mainstream um, conservation and, like, environmental movement. Um, and, you know, their, their lives and their exposure to pollution wasn't really taken into account because they felt like it was just such a small piece. Um, and so some of these big green organizations perpetuated a lot of racism. And even with the you know, building of the national park displaced a lot of indigenous people. Um, and so the environmental justice movement really is rooted in indigenous knowledge. And part of that is knowing that we actually do have the answers. And there's a lot of ancestral knowledge and indigenous science that can guide us um, towards creating sustainable futures. And so one term that you know, has been in the news a lot that we've been kind of talking about um, is false solutions and it's kind of an umbrella term to describe some of these newer technologies um, one of them for example is like carbon capture and sequestration um, and the problem with these so-called solutions is that they're not actually addressing the root of the issue they're not actually calling for us to reduce you know the, our carbon footprint and like the fossil fuel industry it's just thinking about different ways for example capturing the carbon and storing it underground and then the communities that are going to be impacted are going to be those that are most marginalized and so as you know as these new technologies develop we're not necessarily against new technology but we have a lot of questions as to to, you know who's profiting off of them who's going to be impacted by them and is it are we actually really you know targeting the root of the issue are we actually shifting away from the fossil fuel industry or is this just another you know technology that's going to help the fossil fuel industry continue to make profit or tech companies continue to make profit um, while local communities are still impacted and um, regarding the the work um, not just in Austin, but uh, generally you've said that the um, commodification of land in, um, is underlying, li literally in this case, un underlying the environmental justice and uh, climate crises. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so one of the things, um, so actually in my undergrad um, degree, I got to read a lot of like critical theory, um, which was really cool and um, kind of look at the history behind the climate crisis, right? I feel like a lot of, a lot of us don't know how we got there here or like what to do about it. And I think it's really important to understand the whole process of industrialization um, and the creation of the system that, you know, in capitalism that we prioritize profit making over the lives of people, the well-being of the planet and the well-being of others. And part of that is we've completely commodified land. Um, and I think a lot of us, um, myself included, have been very disconnected from the land that we live on. Um, and we see it 
as something that can be exploited, that can be used for profit, that one person owns or another person owns. Um, that's kind of gotten us to where we are, right? Because companies, right, they just buy land, they just exploit land. Um, and we don't have that connection. We don't care for the land like a lot of indigenous people across the world have um, for centuries and centuries. And I think that is one of the core causes of the climate crisis. And so that's something that I've kind of been studying and looking into um, about how do we actually teach youth um, and community members of all ages to reconnect with the land, um, to have that you know different value and that relationship with the land that will allow us to not just see it as something to be used. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the Land Institute, so you've got a friendly uh, audience here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if we um, um, discuss uh, more uh, recent uh, development, you um, and, and your colleagues started the um, uh, group uh, uh, Start Empowerment. Um, and so we'd uh, like to um, hear some about how that happened. I, I know it, part of it is that you um, saw that the um, the mainstream movement, but there were things that were being um, left um, unaddressed. Um, but um, the part of that I, I see is the uh, uh, Climate Justice Community School. And I'd like to um, read from, but before Alexia um, describes that, um, I was going to read uh, from, from the website what, uh, what they um, say about the Community Justice Climate School. Here at CJCS, we don't have fellows, we have vanguards. Historically, youth have been at the forefront of events that have changed the face of history. For us, vanguard is an aspirational name in, in that we hope to help in fostering the next generation of conscious climate activists, organizers, scholars, advocates, one in which one in which will catapult society forward as the generations before them have. I, I like the sound of that. And it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's good to have ambition, in that, it, but it, it, it sounds great. So uh, anyway, just generally about Start Empowerment and the school. Yeah, um, so I co-founded Start Empowerment alongside my co-founder here in 2019. Um, so I actually attended this um, exposition called the Wallerstein Exposition in New York City. And they had hundreds of environmental educational programs. They were tabling. Um, and all of them were really great. But all of them focused on the environmental science aspect of it. And none of them were talking about the political component, the justice component. Um, and so I really saw kind of that gap in environmental justice education. Um, and so I, I wrote up a, a curriculum. Um, and uh, at that time, one of my friends uh, went back to work at her local high school in the Bronx, and I pitched it to um, the vice principal. He loved the idea. Um, and so we implemented the curriculum at that school, and then more teachers reached out to us. And so we continued to you know, um, work with teachers to implement that at several schools in New York City. Um, and then from there, it kind of grew into a nonprofit organization. And I think for me, I always come back to education um, with the work I do because these are not things that are taught in schools and for youth most of our time is spent in school right K through 12 that's a long time to not be learning about the climate crisis about environmental justice about organizing about politics um, and a lot of people don't, don't necessarily know about all of this which is you know a huge barrier to even taking action and even just you know being in Texas and talking to people from different communities that have different opinions you see how perspectives are just fully shaped by education and so before we can do any action there has to be that mass education um, and I also see education as not necessarily something that has to be, you know, informal spaces. It can be in informal spaces like this. And it can also, it's not just necessarily me giving knowledge to other people. It's we're building knowledge together. Um, and so we really wanted to create a curriculum that kind of like embodied that and really centered student voices. And it was really cool to kind of see 
students connect their lived experience with some of the terms that we were introducing to them and have them share what their perspective is from growing up in their neighborhoods and kind of how they saw environmental justice and injustices play out. Um, and so that's kind of how Start Empowerment um, got created. And then last year, our, we started brainstorming about ways to do more community-based education, which is how our Climate Justice Community School came to be and our Vanguard program. Um, and so we drew a lot of inspiration from kind of um, past uh, movements here in the United States, thinking about like Earth Schools, the Black Panthers, et cetera. All of them kind of had a very well built out education program and really youth at the forefront leading some of the movements and we were thinking about you know what is it that we need to be able to successfully build out a movement and part of that was the education aspect it was learning new skills it was financial funding for youth to you know be able to lead those projects and have the time to do so and so that's how we created our vanguard program mm -hmm. um, so we currently have ten, 10 incredible vanguard and they're all leading a wide range of projects from fighting the North Brooklyn pipeline to building community gardens. Um, so they're doing some really cool work and we basically are helping with like mentorship, providing funding and kind of guiding them through, you know, the process of like how do they get involved in politics? How do they get involved with community? And like also connecting them to all the existing networks um, that are already present, right? There's no need to reinvent the wheel. So really, you know, we make sure that our work, even though it is youth led, that it's always intergenerational and that we learn from the wisdom of our elders. Um, and so that's our program and it's been going on for um, six months now, the Vanguard program. So um, yeah, it's been an honor to work with those folks and hopefully we'll continue building it out. Um, now, I understand you've uh, got uh, some, a, a few busy weeks and, and months uh, ahead of you. You're in, um, in grad school now at, at, at Harvard, but uh, you're, you're soon going to uh, head down to D.C. for some lobbying and then to Sharm el-Sheikh for COP27. Um, could you tell us what, what you're going to be up to? And, and how um, the kind of grassroots uh, climate people are going to be um, um, handling uh, being at uh, one of the um, climate summits in a, a kind of a, a weird place like <laughs> Sharm el Sheikh, where it may may not there may not be as much uh, freedom to um, uh, to do what you would do, say in Glasgow or Copenhagen. Yeah, so I think as part of my kind of organizing work, um, I like both do work, you know, outside of the system, kind of thinking about building community and resilience and mutual aid. And then I also do work more like inside the system. So engaging um, with political systems, both at the local and federal level. Um, so I don't know, as many of y'all probably have heard, there's kind of a mansion's side deal. Um, that is, he is currently trying to pass um, in September because that's when they have to pass the budget reconciliatory bill and he's trying to attach it to that. Um, and this side deal um, basically was made um, to get Manchin's vote on the IRA. And the bill that is proposed um, was actually written um, with the American Petroleum Institute. So that gives you a little <laughs> insight as to what is in the bill, um, but it essentially allows the fast tracking of fossil fuel projects without any community input. And it was also gut out a lot of the protections that we have with NEPA. So it is an extremely harmful bill. Um, and a lot of grassroots communities have really, you know, mobilized around it in the past month. Um, there's been, you know, letters signed out. We got 77 um, Congress members to sign on to it. There were seven senators that publicly also signed on to our letter. Um, we have over 600 grassroots groups across the U.S. that have also signed on, and we've been doing a lot of lobbying, a lot of phone calls, a lot of press around it. Um, so next week I'm going to D.C. We're going to be doing another huge push around it as kind of the final days. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm up to. And then COP27 is also coming up. I think COP... Um, is always really interesting because it is not made for any grassroots voices to be included. 
It is not made from anyone from the global south to be included. It really was made for the head of states and for corporations to be at the table. But I think a lot of grassroots groups from across the world and indigenous groups have noticed that if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And so despite you know, not being a pleasant experience showing up, um, groups have consistently shown up um, and kind of had both an internal and external strategy. So thinking about what can we do when in negotiations, how can we push forward you know, even small pieces of language that would protect you know, indigenous rights, et cetera, that we can later use. Um, and then kind of the external strategy, um, which includes you know, protests, press, et cetera, to put the pressure um, on these governments to make actual commitments um, towards shifting away from a fossil fuel economy. Um, and I think this year, this year is definitely going to be interesting um, given the lack of opportunity with some of the external kind of opportunities to do strikes and protests, et cetera. Um, but I think, I think it's um, important to keep in mind that, especially coming from the United States, that a lot of the grassroots groups, our goals is really to pressure the U.S. government and to really look at what we're doing before kind of like pushing other governments, especially given, right, how much of historical CO2 emissions come from Europe and the United States, we really have a huge responsibility um, to the world to really make those commitments and to really be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. And so I think that's kind of the message that we're, the broad general message that we're going into COP27 with. Um, and then we're still in the process of doing kind of some strategy of like what our demands are going to be, especially in negotiations. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think it'll be an interesting experience, definitely an exhausting one. Um, but there's been a lot of really cool solidarity that has come out of that conference um, and previous ones. And to be able to make those global connections, I think is really important. There's a lot for us to learn from what different local communities have done. Um, and so that exchange of ideas um, is something that's really beautiful. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, were, you, were you in Glasgow last year? I was actually not, but uh, some of my team members were. Yeah. It was frustrating there that it, at the very end, the U.S. and India, a couple of other countries, um, they're, they're, they had, right toward the end, um, still had in the statement the, that comes out of the conference uh, something about it, uh, phasing out fossil fuels and um, our country and others got it switched to phasing down fossil fuels and it was it would have been a historic thing to have in there but it uh, was undercut yeah I think one thing to point out is even in this past week the director of I think it was the World Economic Forum or something was saying that um, he did not answer the question as to whether he believed in global warming or not. And I think the president of Chase as well, it was found out that um, he has no plans in divesting from fossil fuels. And so it's really important to keep in mind that, you know, even till today, the heads of these oil, the oil industry and of these, you know, international um, coalitions and organizations are still very much against um, phasing out of fossil fuel because they're making so much profit off of it that it you know doesn't make sense for their personal interest um, to do that even though the majority of the world supports a transition. Um, would you uh, like to see if anyone has questions for you from from out here? Are we equipped with the with a mic? Okay, okay. So um, questions we're going to take. I'm going to ask you to do something um, that will help everyone, and that is to essentialize your question. So really, really think about it. Distill what you want to say so we can get a few in. And also, if you've already asked a question, I invite you to let someone else ask this one. Thank you. Um, this is a question I have been asking a number of people. I'm really interested in your response. When I talk to someone and try to explain what is happening, what is coming right now, frequently, it's like a traffic engineer 
or a politician, and they, their eyes get big, like that, and they don't say anything. They don't, they don't say anything. And have, I'm, I'm sure that's happened to you. What do you do when that happens? <laughs> I mean, I don't think you can kind of control the reactions of other people. Um, but what I like to do is, you know, I offer my piece of knowledge and sometimes I ask them, you know, what they think about it or I'll give them time to process and I'll follow up with them, find them in a couple days, ask them if they, you know, they have any thoughts about what I just shared. Um, yeah, or send them an email. But sometimes people just, you know, take time to process or don't want to respond, quite frankly. Um, and I think that also says something. Um, sometimes a non-answer is an answer. I'd like to add a little more in context, or ask you to add a little more context to COP27, because yeah. Sharm El Sheikh is in Egypt. Um, and so as we watch the news of COP27 coming up, um, I've spent a lot of time in Egypt and have taken students to Egypt multiple times. And so would you expand a little bit on why that matters? And you referred to that, but can you add a little more information so we have a better sense of why it's interesting and important that Egypt is the governing body for what's going to be happening at COP27? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm not an expert on the geopolitics of um, the Egyptian government, but um, they are known to be, you know, to abuse human rights, um, especially for LGBTQ uh, members and women, and there's, you know, different protests throughout um, the years, and I think that was a concern that was raised by a lot of queer activists, was like, is it safe for us to go? And the answer is not necessarily. Um, and I know multiple people that are, you know, queer and that are more kind of like femme presenting or like outwardly visibly queer that are not going because of these human rights abuses. But I think on the other hand, it's important that we don't just avoid COP27 because of the abuse that the you know, Egyptian government has committed because a lot of these Western countries that you know, are perhaps more safe for protests also commit huge human rights abuse just in different forms. Um, so you know, thinking about the US government and us bombing other countries, et cetera, et cetera, and about you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that. Um, so I think it's important that we don't just like avoid it, but it is something that needs to be talked about. And I think a lot of us in the grassroots groups are looking for ways to stand in solidarity with um, the movements in Egypt that are fighting for LGBTQ rights, women's rights, and environmental justice on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, I think the other thing that Stan just mentioned is it's kind of being called like the African cop, um, which actually I um, was talking to an activist a couple days ago who is leading kind of a pan-African uh, delegation to COP27, and she really felt like this was setting the entire continent up for failure um, and up for kind of like bad marketing, being, you know, named the African cop and kind of setting it up for criticism. Um, and then also being Egypt, which is not necessarily representative of the entire continent uh, and in most of the countries and the circumstances um, in these different countries. Okay, wait, hang on one second. We have a question down here and then... We have one right here. We'll just zigzag back and forth. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Oh, yep. I have a lot of things in my lap, so... <laughs> Uh, essentially, my question is, uh, it, do you have any suggestion on how to build uh, like intergenerational camaraderie and like unlearning a lot of like the biases and traumas that have kept like the generations from being able to help each other in advocacy spaces? That is a big question. Um, I'm still learning how to do that. I mean, I think part of it is um, one thing that I've been kind of like implementing in my work is transformative justice models. Um, so thinking about, you know, how we can all come together and talk about different harms, um, because even within, you know, communities of color, within marginalized communities, within a coalition or an organization, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of, you know, different interpersonal relationships and things. I know people who are like, I refuse to work this person because of something they said 30 years ago. 
Um, and that is common in grassroots spaces. And so I think coming together, right, and taking accountability and addressing harm in a safe space and facilitating that. Um, and I've worked with some people who like do specialized work in like kind of community healing and different therapists that focus on that, that have kind of come and help um, build our communities because, you know, at the, at the center of community organizing is building community and that's what leads us to power and so we really do have to address kind of those issues um, and yeah like talking about it right talking about all the issues that came up and um, the things we can learn from the elders and the things we can learn from the youth and why it is important that we are together and I think a lot of people do want to work together intergenerationally um, there's just often you know some barriers to that and we're often not in the same spaces so I think making that conscious effort um, to be in those spaces to invite elders and youth to different events and gatherings and make those connections and see how we can collaborate will always make us stronger. Um, hi, thanks so much for being here. Really curious to learn a little bit more about Tesla. Uh, so much of Tesla's aura is caught up with Elon Musk and his antics and crazy aspirations for colonizing Mars and his wealth. And there's been, you know, difficult stories about, I, I've seen stories about how the spaceport developments have really disregarded local communities. I'm curious if you could give us any insight into your experience with the culture of the organization, not necessarily Elon Musk, but what it's like to engage with Tesla and what kind of an organization is it to engage with uh, from a local community basis? I think um, in Austin, it's been really frustrating because Tesla came in, they had a deal with the county, right? And they really had zero plans for a community engagement. Um, and we really forced that upon them. We built out a coalition and started talking to the press to the point where they had to answer our emails and actually come talk to us. Um, and so I think, you know, you could really tell from their company culture that that wasn't something that's in their DNA, not something that they necessarily cared about. Um, and they were very much just coming in here and, you know, they, were, they saw community members as either, you know, workforce or like land to be exploited and to be used. And it's, you know, a very profit driven environment. And I think also given the loose regulation that Texas has is one of the main reasons they're there. Um, they're being sued currently in California because of racism. And um, they've, you know, also had a history of like having to pay fines to the EPA for environmental damage. And so being in Texas is very beneficial because of all the loose regulations. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. Um, we're still at the table with them. Um, there's upcoming meetings. Um, there's definitely some folks that, you know, work for Tesla that are trying to do some community engagement. I'm not sure how much power those folks actually have within the company at large, um, but we are trying to push um, for them to make commitments um, such as, you know, ecological restoration, um, community education programs. Um, one of the main things we're pushing for is for them to hire Spanish speakers and to actually, you know, um, have programs where Spanish speakers can learn some English to be hired because they are in a predominantly Spanish speaking community um, and things like that. But, you know, I think as with any major corporations, it's always kind of like a back and forth dance of you know how much do you actually want to collaborate with them um, how much external pressure you put um, and it's kind of a very fine thing but we are a little bit hopeful that something good will come out of these negotiations and talking with them and kind of pushing them to understand that they need to go above and beyond and can't just you know come here build a factory keep profiting and not care about the community they're in So I wanted to uh, shout out to you, uh, or reach across to you from uh, the state of Kansas, the state of Texas. We share some common political grounds there. And I wanted to uh, also kind of connect with Toya's question about intergenerational connection. I really appreciate the fact that you're working with schools, directly with high schools. Um, so my question is, in the face of people who are coming to school boards, in the face of state legislatures like ours that are gradually eviscerating public schools for shuffling off tax dollars to private schools, do you have any suggestion and, or have you had any experience in how to counteract that kind of freedom movement in both states and essentially in much of the United States? 
Yeah, so that's um, not the focus of my work, but I do really support the activists that are doing that, um, that are countering kind of the privatization of the entire school system, which is extremely harmful. Um, and also the, all the bans on like books and like teaching certain histories, et cetera, in school. I think it's really important for us to all get involved in kind of like civic engagement. And a lot of things can actually happen even at the local school board level, even just showing up and testifying um, at the school boards and kind of demanding what you want. Um, and I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of power in organizing and with like parents and students coming in together um, and to, you know, try to pass local legislation or state legislation or counteract um, national le legislation. So I think, you know, while it's not directly environmental justice, it is so closely related. And at the end of the day, the campaigns are still right the same. The way you structure out a campaign, you, you know, you pick your cause, you kind of map out who has the power to give you what you want and you strategize as to what are the things that you're going to do, you know, whether that's press, protests, policies, etc., um, to counter that. And I think that's, you know, a very, very important movement um, that impacts every single movement here in the U.S. Thank you for being here. I, I have a question about the Paris process itself and your perspective on it. Uh, last year was COP26, the Paris Agreement went into full effect. We don't have the first global stock take until next year, COP28. And now we begin this, this kind of five-year cycle of global stock takes and then increased ambitions and that five-year cycle out for the next six terms or whatever. It's designed now to be as boring as it possibly can be. So how do we put Pro, uh, pressure on the cop on these cops uh, in, within that framework and at what point might there be a disruption and where would we pull the tr trigger to burn down the entire Paris process <laughs> I'm totally down with that um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's hard um, because, again, like you said, it's designed to be slow moving. It's not designed to create change. Um, and policy as a whole, even you know, on the national level um, in the US, is not really designed for fast change, which is what we need. Um, I think a lot of us kind of know that the real change is not going to come from COP and that we are really there just to prevent kind of some of the disastrous kind of negotiations or things that could happen if we are not present and our voices are not a part of the discussion. But I think most of us, um, and I say us as like kind of the grassroots groups, um, really see local movements as the change that is needed and don't necessarily expect radical change coming out of COP, right? Because of, you know, who's leading it and also because it's so top down and also because like at the end of the day, they don't have any like that, even like the Paris Climate Agreement doesn't actually have any teeth. Countries can just opt out, they can just not do it. Um, there's not many ways to hold them accountable. And so I think right now we're kind of just attending it to make sure that our voices are part of it and we're not, you know, being completely screwed over while building those movements at home that we think are going to be creating the change um, that needs to happen. And I think trying to build that movement, I think for me it goes back to education, right? When we think about burn the whole system down or how can we create alternative systems that are not colonial, that are not capitalist, it goes back to we need mass education, we need people on board, we can't have a top-down revolution. It has to be bottom-up and it has to come from the people. Hi. Um, so in this work, I've gotten to meet a lot of really passionate young people who are working in agriculture and organi organizing uh, environmental work. And that's been amazing. And I've also seen the ways in which some of these structures meant to fight capitalism and fl fight climate change reenact those things where I've seen a lot of over exploitation of the energy and the passion and the labor of young people as they get involved in this work, which can sometimes lead to burnout and disconnecting altogether. I'm wondering about in your work as you're educating and getting bringing more young people into this work, how are you teaching about self advocacy and how to work on self empowerment and growth to avoid burnout as we're doing this really urgent work? 
I'm so glad you asked this question um, because I was just talking to a friend the other day and I was like, I think every youth activist I know is burnt out, which is a problem. Um, I think in organizing space, there's very much this culture of like, we have to do more and more and more at the expense of ourselves, um, which we need to shift away from. And one thing I've been really reading a lot about and preaching is, you know, both self-care and collective care. Um, thinking about how we center that and how we center healing in our work because we are looking to build a sustainable movement and it doesn't serve anyone to burn out and then leave the movement um, because of the, you know, the conditions. And so I think we need to make sure that, you know, when we're talking about these systems like capitalism, that we're not perpetuating that in our interpersonal spaces. And so I think, you know, for work that looks like, you know, making sure we have time off, making sure we're respecting boundaries, making sure that you know we are um, distributing work and like if we ha have a need for increased capacity to look for that need to look for someone to fill that need sorry and not just like you know putting it on someone and to know when to say no to you know to opportunities to campaigns etc um, because it's more important to carry one out well than to take on many and so I think that's something that I'm starting to see more conversations around, um, thankfully, but something that the movement as a whole needs to work on. And then I think the other thing is that while the media likes to kind of glamorize the youth movement to know that it's not necessarily something to be glamorized, um, I'm really honored to be doing the work that I do and so are all the other incredible youth that I've met. Um, but in an ideal world, I don't think that, you know, kids, especially young kids, should be having that responsibility of doing such hard work um, on top of that. Yeah. And so I think, I think it's really important for us to not glamorize that and to you know, really encourage interdimensional organizing and making sure that everyone of all ages kind of gets involved and puts in their part to create a more sustainable movement. Is this on? Oh, there we go. Um, but I want to turn it back to both of you, just for one minute, and um, to name again that this um, effort of Stans and, and the community he's, he's creating um, is um, written in a, in a blog post on City Lights Books website once a month. Called, it's called In Real Time. And <clears throat> to get a beautiful visual, it's Time by Preeti Gulati Cox is the way to do that. Um, and that's um, up for you to visit right on the other side of the Red Barn Gallery. So I wanna just say that in 10 years from now, after this spark of a conversation on this stage at Prairie Festival, what do you imagine might have come to bear from our connection here today and you two connecting with one another? Just imagine it, in 10 years, given that we are creating this movement from the ground down and that's what we're talking about, can you see how we might have planted seeds together and had them grow? And you might not answer that, you might just take that as a vision um, for what's possible. But I'm gonna hand this back to you and then you'll have about a minute to wrap up and then we'll go off. All right. I firmly believe that it will lead to great things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, there's no way of knowing yeah, we, what we have lying ahead of us uh, in those next 10 years or what the um, former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld called unknown unknowns. We, we, there are a lot of things that we know that we don't know, but there's going to be a lot more that we don't even uh, get, that we don't expect, and we're we're you know, seeing that already with uh, climate change. But but I think the more that we do the kind of uh, um, discussion that we're we're doing here today, the better prepared we're going to be for it. Um, so now. Uh, I, I think Alexia should <laughs> save me here and uh, say, <laughs> say something coherent. <laughs> I was trying to buy some time by having you go first. Um, 
I mean, I don't have the answers, and also if someone says they do, I would probably run the other direction if someone claimed they had all the answers. Um, but what I think is beautiful is that, you know, we have a community of here of people that care so deeply about each other and about Mother Earth. And we know that we are dedicated to that, you know, in whatever work we do, whatever um, that can come up and you can integrate that in your life. And that gives me so much hope for all the new possibilities. And I think, you know, as we move forward, there's so much room for imagination of new creative solutions that are grounded in old wisdom, but also new um, creative ideas. And so I am, I am hopeful. Um, I try to practice hope as a discipline and I am hopeful for what is to come and what all of us can imagine together. And I think it's important to keep walking and imagining and moving forward, even if we don't have the solutions yet. And <laughs> and, and finally, following up what, uh, what uh, Emily said, um, there are several parts to the um, uh, In Real Time project. Um, in, including uh, Preeti's um, visual work down here, um, and also Sarah Cruz does uh, an audio version of these um, these written um, uh, essays that are at uh, City Lights Books. Um, and um, I know Alexia prefers listening to the. Uh, to Sarah, and I, I know a lot of other people say, yeah, I'd, ra I'd rather hear Sarah tell me than to <laughs> read you. Um, and, and then we have, so for all, all three of these things, there are QR codes uh, down at, at Preeti's tent and in, in the bookstore, um, ra rather than me um, reading out uh, URLs to you, um, but uh, look for those. URLs are on there too. Though. Thank you.